the few, the faithful. Can I borrow this? Thank you. Uh, Everyone can turn around and say hi to those who are watching online. Hopefully they're enjoying the cleaner picture of the video camera. Had a lot of fun installing all this this week. We had hung the two, well, we hung one, and we opened the box and found out that that one was warped. So we had to take it back to Walmart, get a new one, hung it. It's working fine. Got this mic up that we're still playing with, so it's catching all of you all's sound so that Dean and David and Brooke don't feel so... On your island? There you go. (laughs) Isolated. And we've got the new camera out there. Had some fun trying to get it connected to our internet, but it's working, and it's a lot of fun. It's fun because there's presets to it. I know I said some of you, but you hit this button and it'll zoom up to the pulpit, or it'll zoom over to the piano, or it'll zoom over to Brooke, or it'll zoom all the way out, and all you have to do is hit the button. It's so much fun. PC said he might be playing with it. We'll see. He's still trying to get the sound. You are playing with it. Okay, cool. Uh, We're still trying to get the sound mixed with that and having to move the speakers back a little bit so that this doesn't catch that and have feedback. So a lot of stuff going on, but it's fun. Got some announcements for you who got a bulletin and for you who are watching online. Uh, We are uh, advertising the Weekend to Remember Retreat. Uh, We've got uh, Lincoln in February 10th through 12th, or Omaha on March 17th to 19th. As it says here, if you want to focus on your marriage, you want to take some time away and learn how to grow together, these are great retreats to go on. Uh, We as a church do have a discount, so if you sign up with a specific code and that's on the back table, you will get it. And if you're online and want to know that code, let me know. Uh, They are great things, either whether your marriage is going great or your marriage is on the rocks. It, It helps everyone. So make plans to attend if you can. We do have church directories available on the back. Please let us know of any changes that need to be made to them uh, because some people fell through the cracks over this last year. Some people moved, all that sort of thing. So if you see any changes, let me know and we will reprint an actual official copy next month. We were going to start the Art of Parenting adult Sunday school class today, uh, but since it's cold, Not very many people are here. We're going to push that off to start it next week. Fellowship meal, sorry, not next week, two weeks, because next week is fellowship meal. No Sunday school. So make plans to bring some food. Uh, If you are not here today, you get to bring double the food. (laughs) Pie and prayer, again, every Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. We are having a membership class for us at the church, February 18th from 1130 to 3. So if you are not a member... Uh, You can come. Let me know if you are coming so I make sure there's food for everyone. We're going to eat some food. We're going to talk about who we are as a church, what we believe. Be time for you to ask all the questions you want about who we are, what we believe, all that sort of thing. And we'll talk about what it means to be a member, the expectations, what it means to covenant with the local body of Christ. And then finally, February 11th, Mug and Muffin Ladies Fellowship is coming up on that day, 10 a.m. here at the church. Any announcements that I should know about? Good. Senior Center is having a fundraiser uh, at the Ag Society beginning of March. There's a sign-up sheet on the back if you would like to donate some pies for that, and please do plan to do that. I noticed there's a flyer for a fish fry coming up also. I didn't look to see what the date was. February 24th. (gasps) We can eat there? Yes! Oh. Carry out or eat in, I will be eating in. Oakdale has the best fish fry, so be there. If you want more information, back table. Any other announcements? Jen. Yes. be praying for the Snodgrass family and their accident that happened. Colby was not in the vehicle, so be praying for them as well. Any praises or prayer requests to add on to that? Nope. 
Okay. Well, turn to someone near you. Let's pray a little bit. What's up? Hmm? The video for you? Oh, thank you. Yes, that's why the sound person. Before we pray, now, nah, we'll pray first, then we'll do the sound. We'll do the video afterwards. Okay, let's get with some people near you. Let's spend some time praying. And I'll play a little preview of the Sunday school coming up. Thank you for the ability to worship you. Thank you for a warm building, for boilers that work, for the roof that keeps the snow and the cold out. Thank you for technology that brings your message to those who can't come, and they can feel connected, and they can hear your truth. And even those who've never attended, they can pop in and see who you are. Lord, thank you for blessing us with an upgrade in technology that we might do a better job, easier job. I don't know what term, but we can, we can show people who you are through this technology. And we can keep upgrading and showing that we care about you and you, you do provide even for little things like a new camera, uh, though it's rather expensive. And it's not a little thing. But Lord, thank you. Thank you for providing. Thank you that we can bring your message over the internet around the world. Lord, I ask that you would be with everyone this week, especially today, tomorrow, through the cold weather, keep them safe. As their whole people are holed up in their houses, may they not feel alone, but may they feel a sense of community. And may you use this time to draw them close to you. As they're forced, some people, to stay inside, uh, may they not fill their time with little things, 
but may they take the opportunity to seek you. And for us, as we continue going through winter and as we are able to go around, I ask that we would not get caught up in the busyness and the distraction and the frustration of more snow, but we would see your hand, see your grace, see illustrations of your glory and your goodness all around us. We take every opportunity, Lord, to see you. Lift our eyes up to that. And today, as we have a different service, I ask that you would be glorified and honored through everything. Thanks, Father. Amen. Well, here is a little preview of uh, the Sunday school class that will start in two weeks. How long this kid's going to live? Everything changes. And I happen to know how long every kid lives. They live forever. Our decisions, our lives are going to affect 10 generations down the road. With the birth of our firstborn daughter, I literally had the feeling of wanting to turn her over if I were the instructions. When you look at scripture, it's not the children's minister or the youth minister that God calls first to disciple children. It's the parents. If we want to expose our kids to God, we need to view them like God views them. God is an incredible father. God has rebellious kids. Don't be put off because they're not listening to you. They are listening, but in a different way. You're showing them how faith connects to real life. That's really valuable in terms of helping kids understand how faith matters to them. I think there was somewhat of a fear that we're not going to be able to go out and do all the things that we got to. Like, our marriage is going to look different. I get worried that I'm not doing enough. Make sure. parents can be a little overprotective. <laughs> Michael Jr., I was wondering what your feeling is on spankings. I'm a grown man. I don't get them no more, bro. No matter what kind of a family you come from, you can be the first of a healthy generation. Uh, and it's for anyone, even if you're not a parent anymore, or your kids have grown up, or you've never been a parent, Come stay and learn what it means to be a parent so we can help each other raise up our kids to be godly. Okay, Dean.
Well, this is a different day, number one, because it is the fru and the proud that are here, but it's also Fifth Sunday. Uh, traditionally on Fifth Sundays, we take an offering for a uh, missions opportunity. So today, all the offering that comes in is going to go to the Beginnings Pregnancy Resource Center in O'Neill. Now, since there are so few of us, we will extend that offering to next week. So next week, uh, anyone who is not here, you can put in an envelope or mark on a check for Beginnings Pregnancy Resource Center, put it in the offering box next week, and we'll make sure to bundle it all together for that. Uh, and if you he are here and you put your check in and you go home and you feel really guilty and you say, you know, I didn't give enough. Next week, you can give more. It's totally fine. Uh, also, on fifth Sundays, I don't preach. Uh, we do different things. We do prayer services. We do mission Sundays. We do other stuff. Today is Ask the Pastor Sunday. So the past month, I've asked people to put in questions that I will answer. Uh, and normally, I have a kid come and reach into the bucket and get a question out. And there's only one kid here today. So, Grace, would you like to come up here and get a question, or do you want me to go back to you? I will go back to you. Okay, you are going to reach into this bucket, and you are going to pull out a piece of paper, and you're going to give it to me. All right, thank you very much. Good choice. Very good choice. Uh-huh, huh. It's always fun when I read these uh, because then uh, I get to look at it and say, okay, I wonder who wrote this? And I get to analyze the handwriting, and there's some times that I do know who the handwriting is, but they are all anonymous, and I don't tell anyone who did it. The question is, please explain angels, what they look like, According to the Bible, I think most everyone has a wrong image of them. Great question. Thank you for asking it. We've just come through Christmas, uh, a time when people decorate with Christmas trees, decorate with lights, uh, and they decorate with a lot of angels. Everywhere you look, there are angels. Angels here, angels there, angels on a tree, angels in the window, angels glowing out of the darkness. And you're wondering, ah, what is that? Angels, biblically, are intelligent, moral creatures, spiritual beings created by God who, for the purpose of worshiping God and carrying out his will. That is the proper definition of an angel. An angel is an intelligent, moral, spiritual being created by God to worship him and carry out his will. We know that angels were created sometime before humanity was created. We don't know when they were exactly created. The Bible doesn't tell us, but we know that they were created. Uh, Psalm chapter 148, verse 2, praise him, all his angels, praise him, all his heavenly hosts. And then, then verse 5, it says, let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created. Angels were created by God. They are not eternally existent. They were created. We know they were created at one time. More have not been created since God created the angels. We could look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 to 3. For that, we're not going to. The angels who have existed have been witnesses to God's redemptive work since the beginning of time because they've seen it. They saw humanity fall. They saw all that God did to mold history until Jesus came. They saw God mold history up until when he will come again. They've seen it all. But what are angels? They were created. Some people say that those who die, humans who die have become angels in heaven, but that's a lie. Anyone who says that is lying. They may not know they're lying. They might sincerely believe that, but they are lying. It is not the truth. Angels were created by God at the beginning of time, just as humans were created, two separate beings. Humans who die, who have been believers, will go and live forever with God, but they have a very special future awaiting them in eternity. And to say that they've become angels, it gives them a, a future that is not as special as that which is promised to us. Our future is much more special. 
than that of being an angel. What do angels look like? Well, technically, they are spiritual beings. Hebrews chapter 11, chapter 1, verse 14, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Angels are spirits. They don't have a body, a physical body. They don't have it. Just like God is a spirit, the Holy Spirit's a spirit, God the Father's spirit, Holy Spirit's a spirit, angels are spirits. They don't have physical bodies, but sometimes they appear in physical form. Now, notice I said physical form, not human form. The physical form doesn't necessarily mean human. When you look around at Christmas time, you'll see a lot of angels, and the depiction of those angels are female human form, so often. In Scripture, there's only one time where a spiritual being, such as an angel, has been described as female form, and this is just me geeking out. Zechariah chapter 5 talks about this. Did you click off of the program? Okay. Zechariah chapter 5, verses 5 to 11. Then the angel who was speaking to me, that is Zechariah, came forward and said to me, Look up and see what is appearing. I asked, What is it? He replied, it's a basket. And he added, this is the iniquity of the people throughout the land. Then the cover of lead was raised, and there in the basket sat a woman. And he said, this is wickedness. And he pushed her back into the basket and pushed its lead cover down on it. Then I looked up, and there before me were two women with the wind in their wings. They had wings like those of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between heaven and earth. Where are they taking the basket? I asked the angel who was speaking to me. And he replied, to the country of Babylonia, to build a house for it. When the house is ready, the basket will be set there. In its place. These two women in Zechariah chapter 5 are agents, are angelic beings, agents of Satan. What could be considered demons in Zechariah chapter 5. So I have said to some people tongue in cheek, and as I preached through Zechariah, I said it too. So whenever you see a statue of an angel, and is it, in, it is in female form, that is a statue of a demon. So next time a Christmas comes and you see all these angels, you're going to be surrounded by demons. <laughs> On a more serious note, all of the other instances of angels appearing to people, the angels have been described as masculine. So why do we have so many statues of female angels when most of the time in the Bible it's described as masculine angels? I have nothing against females. Okay, come on. When an angel does appear, whenever an angel does appear, an angel always appears, there's a fear factor that happens with the angel. It is, it's not like your neighbor Joe comes over and that's how you treat an angel. There is a fear factor whenever an angel appeared. The question is why. There was something about the appearance of that angel, even though it appeared in physical form, uh, masculine form possibly, there was something about the appearance that caused fear always in the Bible. Could it be that whenever an angel appeared, like Gabriel to Mary or to Zechariah, that yes, it appeared as a human, but there was something odd about it, like something described in Ezekiel chapter 1 for the cherubim and the seraphim. Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel looks up and he saws a windstorm coming out of the north an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounding by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal, and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four wings, four, four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight. Their feet were like those of a calf and gleaming like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. All four of them had faces and wings, and the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a human being, and on the right side each had the face of a lion, and on the left the face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. They each had two wings spread out, spreading out upward, each wing touching that of the creature on either side, and each had two other wings covering its body. It could be that while angels appeared as humans to these people in the Bible, they might show some characteristics like the cherubim. None of the angels who appeared to humans had, had wings, as cherubim or seraphim did, but they might show some interesting things like multiple faces or 
as Revelation describes these, eyes all over the body, we don't know because it never tells us what these angels looked like. The only description we have of an angelic being is the cherubim and the seraphim, and they are grotesque, to put it lightly. We, going through the Renaissance art history, they made it very popular to create angels that looked beautiful. The, the exaltation, the perfection of the human form was placed into angels, but that's not accurate. Angels are not humans. They appear in physical form, but a different form, one that presents awe, and most of the time when described in the Bible, except for the cherubim and the seraphim and those strange females in Zechariah, they didn't have wings. That's as far into it as I'm going to get. I do plan to have a Sunday school sometime in the future and talk about angels and demons. And I'm going to have a lot of fun doing that, but I'm trying to figure out how long it's going to take and to make sure I don't take too long, but also too short. We'll see what goes on there. All right, there you go. Angels. Grace, you want to come up and take another piece of paper out of here? Or sh you want me to come to you? Okay. I'm going to get my exercise. Thank you. Oh, this one. The question is, why did God tell Noah everything was fine in Genesis chapter 9 to eat, then gave Moses the laws about what they could and couldn't eat, and then told Peter to eat anything? Great question. In the beginning, Adam and Eve ate vegetables. They could eat any plant. God said, eat anything in the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everything else is good for you. There's evidence that uh, sometime between Adam and Eve and the flood, people started eating meat. Um, we're not sure, but there's evidence of possibly that happening. But then after the flood, in Genesis chapter 9, God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. At this time, God clearly tells Noah that everything was okay to eat including me, and all God's people said amen. amen. There you go. Everything God created was good and beneficial. Everything was, and therefore was, is good and beneficial for us to eat. We could, talk about, uh, we could talk about moderation and all those sorts of stuff, but everything God created was good and beneficial for us to eat. Then we get to the law of Moses. Deuteronomy 14, 4 to 10. God tells the Israelites what they can and cannot eat. He says there are these are the animals you may eat, the ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roe deer, the wild goat, the ibex, the antelope, and the mountain sheep. You may eat any animal that has a divided hoof and that chews the cud. However, the, those that chew the cud or that have a divided hoof, you may not eat the camel, the rabbit, or the hyrax. Although they chew the cud, they do not have a divided hoof. They are some ceremonially unclean for you. The pig is also unclean. Although it has a divided hoof, it does not chew the cud. You are not to eat their meat or touch their carcasses. Of all the creatures living in the water, you may eat anything that has fins and scales. Put anything, but anything that does not have fins and scales, you may not eat, for it is unclean to you. Leviticus 11 goes into much greater detail than Deuteronomy of all the what you shall and what you shall not eat. The question is, why would God limit the Israelites and what they could eat if he had already told, told humanity that everything was good and beneficial for them to eat, why in the world would he limit it? Well, there is the unclean argument for their health. Unclean animals consistently, if you look at all the animals that they should not eat, there's a danger in eating them. The, they carry diseases. They carry, pe uh, not pestilence, parasites. 
there's different things. That, so God was, God was, through the law, blessing them to maintain health. There's that argument. I believe it goes deeper than that, though. God, yes, had concern for their welfare, but he also had concern for his holiness. Some unclean animals were used in pagan worship, and they were, in fact, worshipped as gods. So the Israelites were to avoid the worship of the pagans. And through this saying, yes, I can eat that, no, I cannot eat that, they were, they were disting themselves from the pagan worship. So the, all the nations around would say, oh yeah, you're not worshiping our gods, and we can clearly see that. Interestingly, if we go through all the laws in Leviticus, and where it says, where, where it comes to laws where we might scratch our heads about and say, why in the world is that there? We can look at a pagan worship practice in the nations around, and this law is directly in opposition to that pagan worship practice. God was also creating a people that was distinct through this. God did not want them to assimilate with the Gentile cultures or in their religions through all this. God wanted the Gentiles to look at the Israelites and say, you are weird. Why in the world are you doing this? Fast forward to the New Testament. The early church is still keeping these dietary laws of the Jews, of what you can and cannot eat, but they were not using this to divide themselves from the non-Christian world. The early church were using these laws to divide themselves from other Christians and to divide the church, even refusing sometimes to share the gospel with some people because they were eating something that was wrong. Therefore, I cannot fellowship with you. I cannot even share the truth about Jesus. Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, Peter is up on a rooftop to pray. And he becomes hungry and wants something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean in my life. He has followed all the law. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheep was taken back to heaven. God is using this illustration to tell Peter that he is supposed to go with a Roman and two other Romans and go and preach the gospel to a Roman family, people who will probably be eating unclean food right in front of him. God's saying, don't divide yourself from people based upon these laws that are out there. Don't divide yourself from people. Preach the gospel. On the backside of it, God has opened up the meal table that we can all eat it. We as Christians do not need to be distinct from the world based upon our legalistic rituals. The Israelites had their rituals to show that they were distinct from the world so the world would see blatantly, these people are odd, these people are different. We as Christians don't have to have that, that the, the physical difference of what we eat and do not eat, what we wear and do not wear. We show our distinctiveness from the world by our pure, undivided devotion to our God. That's what it comes down to. It's a heart change that we have that produces action changes. We have a heart change. We show our distinction from the world by our unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Not allowing barriers to come up, but, but always pursuing reconciliation. That's how we show our distinctiveness. We show our distinctiveness from the world by our love to our greater community. Consistently throughout the world, Christians have shown that they are followers of Jesus Christ, that they are set apart by loving the unlovable in the world. That's how we do it. Put simply, we do not use food to show our status with God, but we use food to lead people to God. We open up our houses and we say, come, let me share life with you so I can share my God with you. Great question. Next question. You should have sat up closer, Grace. Thank you. 
I know who wrote this one because she handed it to me. She lists three scriptures. Um, and then she says, did Jesus give the spirit and then take him back until the time of Pentecost? I call this question, if I can find it, the yo-yo spirit. Did Jesus give the spirit and then take him back? Give the spirit and take him back until Pentecost. The three passages he talks about is John chapter 20, verses 21 to 22. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse 5. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you'll be baptized with the Spirit. And in a timeline, this is after John. And then again, in Acts chapter 2, this is finally Pentecost, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Short answer is yes. Before Pentecost, the Spirit of God did not remain on a person. We can read about Zechariah in Luke chapter 1, verse 67. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. We can read about his wife, Elizabeth, in Luke chapter 1, 41. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. We can read about the person who's going to create things for the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 35, verse 31. And God has filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills, so he can do the things for the tabernacle. We could read about Joshua, Deuteronomy 34, verse 9. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid on hands on him. And the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. We could talk about Saul. We could talk about David. We could talk about Elijah and Elisha. All these people who the spirit of God came on them momentarily for a period of time and then left. The spirit would come down, fill someone, give them wisdom, give them strength, give them direction, and then would leave. Pentecost came, and a new time was started when the followers of Christ, those who had given their lives to him, would have the Holy Spirit from the moment of belief through the moment of death. And the Holy Spirit does some amazing stuff for us, as promised in John chapters 13 through 16, that we'll get into some other time. Incidentally, there will be a time when the Holy Spirit will not permanently indwell people on earth anymore. Uh, it'll be like the times before Pentecost. Paul writes about the coming Antichrist, and he calls him the man of lawlessness. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5 to 7, he says, Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back, the man of lawlessness, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken away. The Holy Spirit is holding Satan back right now so that even though we look out in the world and we say, oh my goodness, it is so evil. All these evil things are happening. Why is it happening? This is nothing compared to what will happen once the church is taken out of the way through the rapture and the Holy Spirit is taken with the church and now Satan is allowed to go free to do whatever he wants to do. Those will be sad, troubled days because people have grown used to living in a world where the presence of God is continually here. We actually have it pretty good. And we shouldn't complain. Good question. Thank you. Oh, I loved this question. Do we know exactly where the wise men were from? If they were from the east, they had to travel west to the Holy Land, but the star was to be in the east. How many were there? We assume three due to the gifts. Were there more? The Magi. Do, 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 do. 
Magi. What about the Magi? Where were they from? The only background that we have biblically of the Magi is found in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. So, this is a map of the Persian Empire. This is dating Matthew a little bit, because the Persian Empire, by the time Matthew comes, is splintered, uh, and you have Rome taking over much of this area there. Okay? I love technology. There were still splintered parts of the Persian Empire over this area that were not under Roman rule. But during the Persian Empire, there was a class of priests and court advisors known as the Magi, is what they were called. These men's basic sole job was to study ancient and sacred texts of all religions and watch for movements of planets and stars that might point to divine messages fulfilling these ancient texts and manuscripts. When David, Daniel was a wise man in the Persian Empire, he was actually part of this group of Magi there. Um, and it can be inferred, Scripture doesn't say, but we can make the logical leap that when Daniel was part of this group, he shared the Judean texts and sacred documents with the Magi so that they would know about messianic prophecies because that is who they are and that's what they do. Since the fall of the Persian Empire, the Magi were scattered in these areas to the east of the red circle that you see, um, outside of the control of Rome, but in areas where there were no king there, and they were watching stars, uh, and they saw a star that signified royal birth. Messianic prophecies mixed with their astrology pointed to one thing, that the Messiah would be born. So, where are they from? They're not part of Rome, but they're part of a remnant of the Persian Empire east of the Roman Empire. The person asks, explain the star. Well, around the time of Jesus' birth, these magi saw a star that pointed to a new king in Judea. Uh, and there's some confusion, as the question suggests, on where the, po the, the positioning of the star. The King James reads... Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. You will notice that there are two easts in this passage. This is why I love this question so much. I get to go into grammar. Uh, there are two easts. The first east that you see uh, is actually a plural noun. Plural noun. It refers, whenever it's used, this plural noun, it refers to the rising of the sun, is what it says. So literally, the text says, ah, went too far. There we go. Uh, Behold, there came wise men from the direction of the rising sun to Jerusalem. Now we know that that is east. That is why so many translations do not say from the direction of the rising sun. They say east, because that's what it is. It is what's called an idiom, a figure of speech to refer to something else. The second east that you see there is singular, singular. And it's normally used for the rising of the star. When you said plural, it's rising of the sun. Singular, it's the rising of a star. There is no direction attached to the rising of a star. None, because stars rise in different places. It's actually a mistranslation, nothing against the King James. I love the King James, but it's a mistranslation to say we've seen a star in the east, because that's not what it said. What it says is we saw a star when it rose. We saw its star in the direction of its rising, is what it says, and have come to worship him. So, it's not in the east. Persians came from the east. Magi came from the east. The star did not. How many were there is the last question. We have no idea how many magi were there. The scripture does not tell us. We know there was at least three because there were three gifts. Um, Eastern Christian tradition 
uh, in, in the Middle East area and the Asia, they have the tradition that there were actually 12 magi that came, but we don't know whether it's three, 12, some number in there. We do know there were more than magi that just came. There were their servants that came. There were their cooks, their support personnel, bodyguards. There was a whole entourage that came. Uh, there was probably 50 people at least that came with the magi to the manger, hmm. the house. That's another question some other time. Okay, two more questions. Choose wisely. Thank you. Psalm 60, verse 8. What is wash pot? And what does cast out my shoe mean? Okay, she is referring to this verse. Moab is my wash basin. On Edom, I toss my sandal. Over Philistia, I shout in triumph. Depending on the translation you use is what you'll see. But you see, wash basin and shoe there. This is a judgmental passage against nations who had consistently harassed Israel. He says, Moab is my wash basin. A wash basin is used to wash hands and feet. So God is saying the nation of Moab is going to be the opposite of Israel. Moab is going to be thrown down to be a servant. Israel is going to be elevated. Previously to this, in this chapter, God speaks from his sanctuary and says, In triumph I will partial out Shechem and measure off the valley of Succoth. Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim is my helmet, Judah is is my scepter. God's telling Israel, Israel, you're going through all this hard time. You're being, uh, people are fighting against you. You're under discipline. You are becoming a servant to these other nations. There's going to be a time coming where I'm going to flip that. I'm going to exalt you. I'm going to bless you. And in contrast to Israel, Moab, one of the nations who have been very much fighting against Israel, is going to be reduced to the status of a servant. They are, they're the shoe reference for Ed- Edom is a little bit more odd. It says, on Edom I toss my sandal. There are two main ideas for Edom. Um, the sandal, uh, huh. I thought I had an outline here, but I guess I cut it out. Huh, too bad, all right. Uh, there are two main ideas. It could be considered that uh, this casting of the sandal is is talking about taking possession of something, that God is going to take possession of Edom as a conqueror. If you think about uh, the story of Ruth, uh, Boaz uh, is asked by Ruth to become her kinsman redeemer. And he says, wait a minute, I can't do it yet. There's someone closer in relation to you. And so he goes to this other dude and says, hey, uh, you need to be kinsman redeemer. And the dude says, no way, not going to do it. Do it yourself. And the guy takes off his shoe, gives it to Boaz as a symbol of transfer of possession. So it could be that God is, this transfer of shoe is happening and God is taking possession of Edom as a conqueror. It could also be referring to a master tossing his dirty sandal so that the servant can dust it off. That's also something that happens at this time. Master comes in, his feet wash, tosses his shoe to the servant, the student servant cleans it off. I lean towards this image because it's consistent on what is happening with Moab. Because Moab is becoming a servant. Edom is becoming a servant. God is lifting Israel up and casting down, flipping, flipping the status of the nations that tried to exalt themselves over Israel. Last question. The question is, what does God do with gold? What does God do with gold? Put literally, in the Old Testament, God used gold to show the riches of his glory. 
the tabernacle, the temple, were made with physical things. And as you walked into them, uh, at the courtyard, it was, it was pretty mundane, a little more ritzy than what it would be in your normal tent because they wanted to, to show that it was something different, something holy. But the farther you got into the temple or the tabernacle, the more ritzy it got until finally you got to the Holy of Holies, the place where the ark dwelt. The glory of God was there, uh, and it was completely gold. As you walk from the outer court towards there, they got to be more gold, more jewelry, to show that, hey, there is a progression going on, that, that there is a preciousness and a purity to God. God used gold to show that to us. In eternity, we're told that streets are paved with gold. Revelation chapter 21, verses 18 to 21. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold as pure as transparent glass. We could read this passage and we could be in awe of the riches of eternity. Looking at our world today, at the dinginess and the dirt and the sin, and we look at what eternity will be, it, it, it sets God and his dwelling place far apart from anything on this physical earth. It shows us his holiness, his purity, his glory. But let's reflect on this a little bit. We say that gold is precious to us, of great worth. There's people that want to put our money currency back on the gold standard because it has great worth to us. But that's to us. God uses gold to show the, his holiness and an awesomeness in his temple and his tabernacle because in our eyes, gold is awesome and is separate and so rich. So God uses it to, sh to show it from our perspective. But, but what is w the worth of gold in God's eyes? He created gold. Yes. So gold is precious to God, but it's just as precious as the rest of his creation. No more, no less. In his eyes, gold and spiders are the same. Think on that next time you want to kill a spider. Gold and spiders are the same in the eyes of God. What is not the same is humanity. We read in Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God created humanity in his image, something distinct, something unique. And he set humanity above the rest of creation. Psalm chapter 8, verse 3 to 6. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is mankind that you're mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them, you've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. We look at gold, we look at precious metals, and so often we put the value of those things over other humans. People steal it. People wreck people's lives. People kill people over these things that have just as much worth as a spider. God looks at humanity and paces us so much higher than gold. He places our faith in him so much higher than gold. Peter speaks of trials, and then he writes in 1 Peter 1, 7, that these trials have come so the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Compared to humanity and our relationship with him, gold is just a paving stone, concrete to be laid and then crushed. What does God use gold with? For concrete. And as a way of showing that we are so much 
worth more than all of that. And that's the end of the questions. I enjoyed them. I would say, does anyone have a question? But I'm not going to. <laughs> you can ask me a question anytime. I love to talk about these things. Uh, but in spirit of this last question of how God values us so much, we're going to sing the old rugged cross as our last song because he did everything that he might have a relationship with us. I was going to advance this over to him. There we go. Wrong number, but I forgot to delete that one. If you, there you go. Thanks. for coming out and braving the cold to be with us together today. Hope you enjoy the rest of the snow. If you want to come, we've got a nice sled run at our house. Everyone's welcome to come and sled down our hill. 
Uh, we have free ambulance service in town. <laughs> Next week, fellowship meal, uh, and we'll continue on with 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll finish up the chapter next week. Until we meet again, whether it is when we're seeing each other out scooping snow, or it is next week for fellowship meal, or it's when Christ calls us home and our salvation is finally realized. May we live our faith every minute knowing that we are very valuable to God, and he's done everything that we might have a relationship with him.